So first out on the floor with discovery, distribution, origins and diversity of the deep is Professor Emeritus Imans Priede. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Inga and uh, Michael, for inviting me here. My role this morning is to uh, generally introduce the concept of deep sea fishes. Uh, how were they discovered? Where do they live? Where did they come from? And their diversity. So, um, a lot of this information is uh, in my book, and I just want to thank Fishbase. Fishbase has become an essential tool for all of us working on fishes in general, and deep sea fishes in particular, and it'll become obvious uh, during the talk how important Fishbase has been. What is a deep sea fish? Um, when they were first discovered, there was some discussion as to what depth limit should one use. Uh, they thought maybe deeper than a thousand meters, but eventually things have converged on that the definition is any fish that lives most of its life deeper than 200 meters. This is now the official definition used by FAO. And, uh, but uh, there are a number of caveats. For example, many fishes produce eggs and larvae that float to the surface, regardless of how deep they live. So there are very few fish, actually, that spend their entire life cycle in the deep sea. They're, they're always cheating, coming up to grab food from the surface or something like that. But the main point is that they are living in the dark ocean. So they, if the maximum ocean depth is 11 kilometers, um, Deep sea fish occupy everything from 200 meters down to 11 kilometers. And the common factor is that there's only enough light for photosynthesis in the top 200 meters of the ocean. So the key point about deep sea fishes is that they are dependent on food derived ultimately from the photic zone. Uh, in the mesopelagic layer, uh, between 200 and 1,000 meters, there is sufficient light for vision to operate, but not enough to keep photosynthesis going. And then those species that live deeper than 1,000 meters are living in total darkness, and we'll be hearing about the adaptations of those fishes. Uh, this is an enormous depth range and uh, represents 65% of the planet area and we can see that the abyssal zone between 3,000 and 6,000 meters is in fact the biggest environment on the planet. Uh, uh, where, and uh, this is the range of the deep sea fishes. Until 200 years ago, um, no, people didn't realize that there were deep sea fishes. Um, in fact, Cuvier and Valenciennes, Cuvier, Baron Cuvier of the Natural History Museum in Paris, did not mention deep sea fishes at all in their 1828 book. Now, it seems unlikely that humans were totally unaware that there are deep sea fishes, because there are natural strandings. These are pictures of fish picked up on the beach on the shores of Sicily around the Straits of Messina, where in certain weather conditions, deep sea fishes are swept to the surface and are washed up on the beach. And uh, in Homer's Odyssey, uh, this Charybdis and Scylla are deep sea monsters in the uh, Messina whirlpools are mentioned. So it's likely that the ancient Greeks were aware of weird monster-like fishes uh, appearing from the deep. These are pictures from Zal in the Nat National Geographic. Also, when uh, scientists started uh, uh, finding deep sea fish, they were very surprised when they visited uh, Lisbon, that just south of Lisbon at Stubal, there were fishermen pulling up deep sea fishes and seemed to have been doing that for hundreds of years. Uh, this is the Portuguese dogfish which is in fact the deepest living shark known on the planet. And uh, 
you know, the scientists are really rather humiliated to find that uh, a fish Portuguese fisherman already knew about this fish. Well, I couldn't come to Stockholm without mentioning Linnaeus. Um, he is, represents a sort of uh, the birth of modern science when he uh, set about publishing his Systema Naturae, where he was wanting to catalogue every living thing on the planet, both plants and animals, picking up from where Aristotle had left off 2,000 years previously. And in Linnaeus's Systema, there are, he recognizes Chimera monstrosa, uh, uh, the, uh, then the lantern shark, Etmoptera spinax, he actually named it Squalus spinax, and also Lophius piscatorius. Uh, these are the depths, the maximum depths from the current fish base. Uh, Linnaeus himself gave no indication as to how deep these fish live. And I'm not sure if Linnaeus had any idea how deep they live. So for the Chimera, he writes Habitat in Mari Atlantico. Uh, for Etmopterus or Squalus spinax, he says Habitat in Europa. And then for Lophius, he writes Habitat in Oceano Europia, a sub lapidum fornicus, uh, under, under stone arches. So there's no information on depth occurrence at all. The, the founder of deep sea ichthyology, to whom we have to uh, thank for starting us off, is really Antoine Rousseau. He's most famous nowadays for uh, Rousseau's dolphin, but he's a uh, uh, a polymath, he's a pharmacist by training, and he was concerned with finding new resources for the Duchy of Savoy uh, around the city of Nice, uh, where he lived. And he describes this fish, Moro Moro, very common at great depths with tender white flesh and good flavor. So he's a very practical man, not just a taxonomist. He was also looking for new resources. And um, and then in his later publication, he writes that uh, in Risso, 1826, the deep basins of the sea are frequented only by leposcephalids, epigonids, chimeras, macrurids. Lesser depths are the habitat of whitings, lynx, hake, soles, trevallies. So he figured out the depth zonation in the Mediterranean Sea, and he's recognizing a, a distinctive deep sea fish fauna. And he also describes uh, a remarkable number of different species. Uh, uh, a deep sea sleeper shark, the deep sea black cardinal fish, the boa dragonfish, the uh, deep sea grenadier, Risso's smooth head. You know, this is a fairly comprehensive collection of deep sea fishes that uh, professionals amongst you will recognize from trawl halls. So he was the first person who really set out what a deep sea fish fauna looks like. And, uh, and, uh, and he, instead of just giving very short, curt descriptions, he gives details of what depths the animals live at, uh, what they, uh, and indeed what they taste like. And in fact, he identified some poisonous species as well. So. Then, if you are, uh, study oceanography in a British university, you are taught that everything started with the Challenger expedition. Um, in 1876, the Challenger expedition circumnavigated the globe over a period of three years, and they actually did dredging down to over 5,000 meters. And the important point is that they found fish at every depth all the way down to over 5,000 meters. And so this was really established that, the global, that there is a global deep sea fish fauna. Uh, the work was written up by Albert Gunther, who was the curator of fishes at the Natural History Museum in London. And he states in his book, the fish fauna of the deep sea is composed cheaply of forms and modifications uh, of forms we find represented at the surface. 
So he wasn't amazed by totally unidentifiable things. He was able to identify things to families that he could recognize from shallow waters. These are some pictures of fish from the Challenger report, uh, some roughies, uh, you know, this one from the Mediterranean, uh, this one from New Zealand, and then uh, they got hatchet fishes. Uh, these are bioluminescent fishes. Uh, the bristle mouse here, uh, the light fish. Uh, so really the uh, science is becoming quite mature at this stage. And then they also discovered this remarkable fish, Itnops murrayi, uh, which has degenerate eyes. The top of the head is just a silvery shield and at the time, nobody knew what this was. It was thought it might be a light organ. Uh, it's now been established by Munch that, in fact, it is a very degenerate eye with just retinal cells spread out over the top of the head and no lens, no globe of the eye or anything. It's just uh, photoreceptors across the top of the head. So it's a bit like an insect eye, maybe, but it can't form images and it can presumably detect uh, light from above. And they found it down to over 4,000 meters depth. Now, there was still the question that everybody knows there's fish that live in the surface layers of the ocean, and the Challenger showed that there are fish living on the bottom, but there was still some question as to whether anything lives in the middle. And uh, the German expedition led by Carl Chung uh, on the Valdivia uh, uh, carried these kinds of nets with an opening and closing mechanism so that the net could be opened halfway down to the bottom at, say, at 2,000 meters, towed and then closed at 1,000 meters. And so the important thing that this expedition showed, which was written up by August Bauer, was that there are fishes throughout the water column and uh, they, uh, well, they went one step further. They produced color pictures in their report. Uh, that, uh, and uh, uh, this Melanocetus Johnsoni, uh, the famous drawing by Fitzwinter. But if you get a copy of the report, you can see it online. It's all color pictures all the way through. This is what uh, one suggestion from a French worker who thought that these fish used to bury themselves in the sediment and then come out at intervals but the Valdivia showed they're definitely not burying themselves in the sediment. They are swimming in the open ocean. So since those times, we've got Linnaeus with just a few species, maybe 10 species, Risso, and then the Challenger expedition and successive, and the rate of discovery of deep sea fishes has been accelerating since that time. Um, a recent assessment from Fish Base is that there, there are current, the, the prediction is that there will be about 5,400, 5,500 species of deep sea fish. There's higher diversity in demersal bottom living fish than in the bathypelagic fish because uh, there's many more niches in the uh, uh, bottom living environment. Just for reference, there are 5,700 species of mammals known. So roughly speaking, uh, deep sea fish diversity is about the same as mammalian diversity. Distribution. Um, the important driver, as I've already mentioned, is production of food at the surface by photosynthesis, diatoms, photosynthesized, copepods. And so there's general transport of food down into the deep. This is the so-called biological pump. This has the effect that as you go deeper, the amount of biomass decreases. So life gets sparser as you go deeper. And fishes are no exception. This is a data dump from Fish Base, uh, which I did together with Rainer Froser some years ago, where we plotted the maximum depth of occurrence of a species against its um, maximum length, uh, both this one on a logarithmic scale. And uh, 
The important thing, first thing, is that most fish live near the, in shallow water. The deep sea is a sparse environment and not many species live there. Uh, the number of species declines with depth. Also, we can see that the range in size declines with depth. There seems to be a convergence onto an optimum size, somewhere around 10 to 15 centimeters long for fish living at the greatest depths. Whereas at shallow depths, you've got everything from tiny little one minnow-like fishes less than one, meter, millimeter, one centimeter long to, uh, to uh, 10 meter long fishes. Uh, the other thing is we can see diff distinctly different depth ranges for the th main classes of fishes. So the uh, mixini, the uh, hagfishes, down to about 2,000 meters. Uh, sharks are very rare below 3,000 meters, and bony fishes uh, extend all the way down to about 8,000 meters. We can plot the same data in a different way. This is the number of species and we see we get against depth, and we get nice regression lines. So the maximum depth for chondrichthys is about 4,000 meters, uh, and the maximum depth for bony fishes, in fact, uh, this is a cartoon from the New York Times where they picked up this story that uh, sharks never go deeper than 3,000 meters. They throw themselves into reverse gear. So. So the important discovery over the last 10 years is essentially that there seems to be a maximum depth limit for fishes of about eight and a half kilometers depth. And there's a maximum depth limit uh, for the chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fishes, sharks and rays uh, of three to 4,000 meters deep. So the very deepest parts of the ocean are fish free and most of the deep ocean is actually shark free. Well, let's just review the evolutionary history. Um, this is a sort of classic diagram of uh, geological time from the Paleozoic, Mesozoic to Cenozoic. And we have the origin of fishes somewhere around 500 million years ago. And there's an immediate diversification during the Devonian in the so-called age of fishes. And then we have the three main classes, uh, four main classes, sorry, Mixini, Chondrichthys, uh, the ray-finned fishes, bony fishes, and the uh, sea lacants uh, surviving through to the present time. Now, the big question is, were there deep sea fish in the Paleozoic? Have there always been deep sea fish? Or as, uh, or is, uh, the evolution of deep sea fish, a recent phenomenon. In this book uh, by Wells, Huxley and Wells, The Science of Life, it is written that most authorities believe that the invasion of the great deep began no earlier than the Cretaceous times. And they say that the marine abyss was such a difficult region to colonize that it stood untenanted for most of geological time. So this is quite extraordinary that uh, uh, the idea that deep sea life is a very recent phenomenon. So we've got three competing hypotheses that we can, that there's an azoic pre-Cretaceous deep sea, or that there were successive colonizations and extinctions, or that there has been some sort of persistent uh, deep sea ichthyofauna since the Devonian. To evaluate these hypotheses, we need to consider what do fish need to live in the deep sea? Well, they need oxygen and they need food. Where does the oxygen come from? Well, the oxygen in the oceans, this is a cross-section of a hypothetical ocean, the oxygen comes from the air and obviously diffuses into the surface layers. Uh, but if nothing happens, the ocean basin is, uh, is stagnant uh, bacteria and other organisms consume the oxygen uh, and there is a natural tendency for the deep sea to be anoxic and in fact this is the status of the Black Sea that there's only fish life in the top 200 meters. Now 
in the global ocean at the moment, we have cooling in the polar regions and cold water sinks, cold oxygenated water sinks and circulates around the world. And this is the, called the global thermohaline circulation. And that is what's keeping the deep sea ventilated. And this is what provides oxygen for deep sea fishes. And deep sea fishes, for example, in the Pacific Ocean, they are breathing oxygen that was put into the surface layers two or three hundred years previously. So they're breathing old oxygen that's circulating. The alternative way of having a thermohaline circulation is in the Mediterranean Sea where you heat and evaporate and then saline water sinks and, uh, and you get an oxygenated deep sea that way. So oxygen has to come from the surface. What about food? Well, this is just to confirm the oldest fish fossil is, are the conodonts from about 500 million years ago in the Cambrian. But diatoms, which are a key link in photosynthesis in the first surface layers of the ocean, only appear 185 million years ago. And copepods only 100 million years ago. So there's a potential that maybe there was no biological pump in the ancient ocean. But um, Robbins et al. found fossil fecal pellets 1,900 million years ago. And in fact, the famous Burgess Shale in the uh, mid-Cambrian does have uh, 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 fecal pellet material. So it looks like there has been a biological pump. So, we, so now the other th question is, is, was there deep sea 500 million years ago? Um, these, this is, shows a continent floating on the... Uh, crust and the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters and this is the state of the continents in the Cambrian uh, and the blue bits here these are deep sea between the continental masses and so it looks like there was deep sea for uh, 5,000 million years ago 500 million years ago but the continents have been moving around until uh, Pangaea, one big continent was formed, and then that broke up and formed the modern continents. So the important point is that there has been deep sea, roughly the same size and same depth as we have now, but the shapes of the oceans is very different. So if we go back to the um, uh, uh, depth limits of the fish, uh, Bethiel, Abyssal, Hadal, uh, the temperature has varied over this time. We're very used to the idea that the deep sea is cold, but in fact in the Mediterranean, the deep sea is warm, and there have been warm periods and cold periods, and in fact during the Cretaceous, when a lot of the current deep sea fauna originated, uh, it was actually quite warm. So if we look at the uh, Azoic pre-Cretaceous deep sea, the idea is that nothing lived in the deep sea until very, very recently. Now, the complication of understanding deep sea fishes is that if this is an evolutionary tree of fishes, the deep sea fish are not on a distinct branch. Uh, that is wrong. We find that there's deep sea fish everywhere throughout the evolutionary tree of fishes, uh, 38 orders and over 200 families. So what I'm going to try and do now is to go through these. Um, in the Devonian, there's a great diversity of fishes. Did any go deeper than 200 meters? Um, this is the variety of fishes. Uh, if we, it seems that only the most modern uh, bony fishes are able to go down to over 8,000 meters. There seems to be a sort of a physiological limit at about 4,000 meters for primitive fishes. So maybe the Devonian fishes invaded the deep sea that deep. But if they did, there's the problem of major extinction events. That at the end of the Devonian, 73% of vertebrates became extinct. And so throughout geological history, there have been these five major extinction events. 
And uh, the last one was the major KT extinction event, which extinguished all the dinosaurs. But only 15% of fishes actually became extinct. Uh, this is the end Cretaceous, stimulated by a great big meteorite hitting in the Gulf of Mexico. But for the deep sea, there's also another problem, is the global anoxic events. There have been seven major global anoxic events where uh, the life in the deep sea apparently became untenable. And so anything that colonized the deep sea has to fight through all these extinction events. And so the suggestion is that there has been successive colonization, extinction, colonization, extinction, and that what we see nowadays is the result of really quite a recent colonization of the deep sea. Um, or the alternative is that there may have been some persistence of fauna. So now we'll start looking at the fishes. Uh, these are hagfishes attending uh, a grey whale skeleton at 1,600 metres deep in the Pacific Ocean. They're about this kind, this size, eel-like fishes, and they've stripped out all the uh, flesh off the uh, uh, skeleton. And, and this is the molecular evolutionary time scale for them, um, that they split off from the other fishes in the Devonian 400 to 480 million years ago. And they seem to have persisted in the deep throughout this time and then just recently. Now the problem with these molecular trees is that extinct branches are missing. This is only dealing with uh, uh, living relatives. So this is maybe a case of that the hagfishes are well known for being able to tolerate low oxygen and they may have simply survived in the deep for a very, very long period of time and have survived through the five major extinctions and all the anoxic events. If we go to the sharks, the chondrichthys, uh, and we look at the three major groups, the chimeras, uh, the selachi, the sharks, and the rays, we can see amongst the holocephali that the main uh, peak in maximum depth is at about 1,000 meters. There's not many shallow living representatives. So this is a deep sea group, whereas the sharks and the botoidae are well represented in shallow, uh, but they stray into the deep. So if we look at the holocephali, these used to be very common in fresh water and shallow waters uh, in uh, Carboniferous times. But the deep sea ones that we see now are survivors that have survived through all the mass extinctions by using the deep sea, as it were, as a refuge. And in fact, uh, 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 and uh, this is a rabbit fish, Hydrolagus, uh, at about, found at 2,000 meters deep, a very characteristic deep water fish. If we go to the sh sharks, the Selachii, uh, there was a, in the Permian, there was a major split between the Galeomorphi, uh, which includes mackerel sharks and uh, the surface living sharks, and the squalomorphy, which specialized in moving into the deep sea. So these animals essentially uh, colonized the deep sea during the Jurassic and Cretaceous, while they were dinosaurs uh, living on land. And these lineages have persisted. And what we see now are ancient fishes which have survived in the deep. And in fact, uh, the, the most recent uh, KT extinction barely affected this group, whereas other groups of fishes were affected. So these can be regarded as ancient relic faunas. And, um, uh, and if we look at this, we can see amongst the squaliformes, we can see that the dominant depth range is quite deep. And in fact, uh, bioluminescence has evolved at least twice in this group of fishes. Where, but 
the problem is that uh, the cilia rhinidae, which is part of the gallimorphidae, which are supposed to be shallow sharks, some of them do invade the deep as well. So it's uh, uh, thing. So this is a deep sea lantern shark, Etmopterus princeps, uh, has uh, lights on its belly, which I think we'll hear more about later. So when we get to the ray finned fishes, things get fiendishly complicated. Uh, some people have described this as the bush at the top of fish evolution. Um, and this shows the uh, 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 molecular evolutionary time scale for them. And uh, the great uh, Russian uh, scientist Anatoly Andriyashev proposed the concept that there are ancient and secondary deep sea fish species. By the way, he had a remarkable career. He published his first paper in 1934 and his last paper in 2008. So he was actually scientifically active for 74 years. Um, which, uh, and he named 124 deep sea fish species in the process. Um, so when you look at families like the halosaurs and the alepocephalids, we can see this is a depth distribution so the predominant depth distribution is between 500 and uh, there's a bulge in the deep. So these are ancient endemic families, such as Halosaurop, uh, these. Whereas we get the Ophidaids and the Liparids, these are recent secondary invasive species, where most of the representatives live in shallow water, but remarkably they have species that have invaded the deep. So, so, so these are what um, Andriyashev termed secondary deep sea fish species. And we can roughly divide the tree of fish evolution into ancient forms which invaded the deep early in the Cretaceous and Jurassic and before, and secondary, which are the more recent ones. So let's just have a look at a few examples. An interesting group is the Elopomorpha. These are the eels and their relatives. And this group of fish is unique because they have leptocephalus larvae, sort of leaf-like larvae, uh, which are thin, transparent things uh, with no gills. They just absorb oxygen through there and through the skin. And the uh, freshwater eels, most of you are probably familiar with the story, actually spawn in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean uh, at a depth of about 800 meters. And it turns out that molecular techniques now show that the deep sea bathypelagic eels and the freshwater eels are closely related. And they all spawn in the same place. Uh, uh, whereas we have distinctive demersal eels, uh, uh, which um, uh, uh, which live on the sea floor. So this is a Sinaphobranchus calpi, which if you put down bait anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean, at be theal depths, uh, these eels are attracted in very large numbers. Uh, but then amongst the bathypelagic eels, we have an extraordinary variety of specialized forms, such as the pelican eel with a very large mouth, and it's able to ingest very large prey, or the snipe eel, which is adapted. To, this has more than 750 vertebrae. This has got more vertebrae than any other vertebrates. So this is the, the ultimate vertebrate on the planet. Um, and then some of them are short bodied. So you've got long bodied, short bodied, small mouth, big mouth, uh, all adapted to surviving in the deep, uh, in the uh, mesopelagic and bathypelagic. Also, within the elopomorpha, we have the halosaurs, which have a leptocephalus larva, and also the spiny eels, which have a leptocephalus larva. And some of these larvae can be remarkable. This one is over a metre long. Uh, you know, when you think of a larva, you always think, oh, I'll just get the microscope. But you don't need a microscope to see this larva. And it actually shrinks as it metamorphoses into an adult. Uh, Notocanthus. Uh, this is a halosaur, uh, uh, and it's a characteristic ancient deep sea species. 
Now, now we go to the Aleppo cephaliformes. Now, if you look at the evolutionary tree, it's right next to the herrings and the Osterophyce uh, freshwater carps and catfish. And so this is a group that somewhere around the Jurassic said, oh, I'm not going to go into shallow water. I'm not going to go into fresh water. We'll just go into the deep. And they're a tremendously successful group. There's 137 species. Uh, there's these platytroctidae, the tube shoulders, which actually have a little tube opening behind the head, and they can squirt bioluminescent material into the surrounding water. Um, and then there's all these aleposcephalids, which have different kinds of light organs on their bodies. They all have relatively highly developed eyes, uh, uh, visual systems. So this is a, a group... Uh, some of them look a bit like salmonid in form, uh, but these have been in the deep sea for a very, very long time. Now we move to Argenti Argentini formes, and these are very varied. Uh, from the Argentines, you know, basic silvery herring-like fish, through to these tube eyes, which have upward-looking eyes, uh, trying to spot prey above, through to these spook fishes, or opistoproctidae. Uh, all of these fish have a crumenal organ in the throat. This is a sort of a grinding organ that enables them to eat deep-sea jelly. And so they can grind up the jelly and swallow it. And like this macropinna, this is the pictures from Robison and Reisenblickler, where they have a, an upward-looking eyes underneath a transparent head, but they can also rotate the eyes. So the idea is they swim along, looking upwards, trying to spot prey, and then when they get close to the prey, they can rotate the eyes and zero in and munch and then grind it up in the crumenal organ. So this is a highly adapted fish, specially built for, for a niche, and it's of a group that's been there a long time. And the next famous group is the Stomiaformes, uh, dragon food. Uh, so we've got the gonostoma, bristle mouths, hatchet fishes, light fishes, and dragon fishes. So these are all related, about 400 species, all adapted to living uh, in the uh, uh, mesopelagic and bathypelagic. So this is cyclothony. You catch them in nets, they're a few centimeters long. This is probably the most abundant vertebrate on the planet thousands of trillions, that's 10 to the 18 individuals on the planet. So this is the most abundant vertebrate there is. Anybody of you who've been out, then we get that remarkable hatchet fish with a mirror-like finish. I remember as a student seeing these for the first time, and they look like they're chrome-plated. It's just so bright. Uh, and with light organs, all of these fish have light organs. I come underneath uh, the... Then we have the dragonfish, which specialize in eating those. Uh, now we go to lizard fishes. Uh, again, a variety of forms. There's ipnops, and, uh, including this remarkable tripod fish. The next group are lantern fishes. There's about uh, a large variety of them. These fish may be there may be 10 to the 10 tons of these. Uh, it, there's half of the world's ocean biomass. If we could catch these fish, we could feed the world very easily. Uh, but the problem is when you tow a net, you only uh, catch 10% of what is there. They're extremely good at, ex at escaping from nets. Uh, this shows uh, a lanternfish. The gadiforms, the cod family. The cod family, uh, the cod group, the hakes, um, grenadiers, hakes, and cods have been very successful in the deep sea, over 600 species. Uh, this is the abyssal grenadier. And in deep sea fisheries, uh, these, this uh, or, uh, group accounts for 80% of the total world deep sea fish catch. So these have become very important. About two and a half million tons caught every year. 
So finally, we go to the Zoatid. These are recent intruders into the deep sea. Um, uh, eel pouts and liparids. And the liparidae, we'll hear more about them later. But the thing is that these are invasive and they're not very specialized. They don't look very special and yet they live deeper than anything else. And they also live at hydrothermal vents in hot water. So they are extremely versatile, successful modern fishes that have invaded the deep. And the zoacids, the eel pouts are similar. Uh, uh, this is from an Atlantic hydrothermal vent and this is from a Pacific Ocean hydrothermal vent. And then finally, I can't miss out the, uh, the anglerfishes, the ceratioid anglerfishes, which have a remarkable range of adaptations, uh, which many of you know about, including the fact that the males are parasites on the females in many species. So we finally come back to Linnaeus. Uh, before I came here, I thought I'd just read what Linnaeus said, uh, wrote. And this is the last page of his section on fishes. And I found this comment. Uh, and it's quis nisi videset pisces habitaris subunda crederet. Who, unless he had seen fish living underwater, would believe it? I would suggest we just, who, unless he had seen fish living in the deep sea, would believe it. Uh, I really felt quite warm when I found this. I thought, yeah. He's a good guy. He must have really seen some interesting things. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Iman. Uh, this was a great uh, presentation, wasn't it? Yeah. We have time for one or two questions, if anyone has a question to, do to Dr. Iman. Yeah. Please. Yes. Uh, my name is Diedrich. I'm working here at the Natural History Museum, uh, and I answer questions to the public. And and uh, what's very interesting about this uh, Messina Strait uh, whirlpools? Is it possible to go there on specific weather conditions and find such fishes there? Apparently so. Uh, I, I mean, I can give you the reference, uh, Czar and his, co well, in fact, his wife went there. I think it's when the whirlpool is really going. And uh, uh, there's a nice article in the National Geographic and it describes it, yeah. And, and you just pick them up off the beaches. And, the, well, he was shown by the local fishermen, this is where you go. You know, that's what, yeah. it's, it's well written up. Uh, you know, I can give you the reference and uh, uh, you can hopefully reproduce that. Thank you. One more. My name is Dan Larhammer, Uppsala University. Uh, you didn't mention lampreys at all. What's the deepest one has found a lamprey? Yeah, the lamprey. The, there's one. The lamprey is a, uh, has a freshwater life cycle and there is a sea lamprey and there is one specimen has been caught at over 4,000 meters deep and uh, kind of don't know what to do with that data point <laughs> you know, because, uh, yeah they are well known I mean I've caught basking sharks with lampreys on them and of course basking sharks can di dive down to a thousand meters deep and uh, yeah uh, Yes, you are right. Uh, whether I did wonder at one stage whether the lamprey, the sea lamprey, has the widest depth range of any species of fish. Uh, but then I thought, well, I started thinking, could I find the highest altitude at which a sea lamprey spawns? And I thought, well, that might not be so easy. But, but yeah, you, you, thank you for pointing that out. It's uh, something I missed in my talk. So the last question I will ask, and that is maybe a little bit outside of your profession, but you mentioned fisheries and deep sea fisheries. Yeah. And working with WWF and fisheries, we are a little bit uh, cautious about what is happening in the biodiversity. We actually pinning a biodiversity campaign this year 
uh, globally. And so what is your thinking about the main threats today for the deep sea fish species? Well, well, the main, th well, the main threats are deep water bottom trawling, which ruins the habitat, but also the major deep water fisheries catch a lot of s different species. We've seen there's a very high diversity, and f you know, for each species that is harvested, there's about ten species which are severely impacted. And in fact, my team has done work which has shown that impact. The other thing is to be cautious about the statistics because the headline figure is the world catch of deep sea fish is 3 million tons. But more than half of that is blue whiting, one species in the North Atlantic. If you delete blue whiting and some of the hakes, then the real deep sea fishes only produce about 1 million tons. And my own opinion is that the environmental damage that's done is just not worth it for one million tons of fish globally. Thank you very much. We will end this presentation now, but before we leave you, uh, I would like to, on the behalf of uh, Naturhistoriska Riksmuseet and Fish Base, give you a little memory of a deep sea fish. Uh, that, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and the little uh, pin you can uh, use as a uh, memory of being here with us today. Ah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.